Welcome everyone to another edition of The Trainer. Today's topic, tackling those catalyst efficiency below threshold DTCs, the PO420 and the PO430. Stick around, that's coming right up. You don't want to miss it. Hey, welcome back everybody. I uh, just want to say first before we get started, uh, my apologies for getting the trainer up a little late in the month. We normally try to have this up and running by the first of the month. Uh, no excuses. We did have the NACE Auto Mechanica training event at the end of July, kind of occupied a lot of my time, but that's neither here nor there. It actually worked out for the best though, because while I was in Chicago, I got to talk to some of the folks at Tenneco, more specifically the Walker Emissions Control Van and some of their trainers, specifically Joe Baccarella, who was very helpful in uh, helping me put the content together for this video. In fact, uh, a few days ago, we had a conversation with Joe, and he was sharing some of their tips and techniques for troubleshooting this very, very common DTC. The first thing I want to tell everybody here is if you're one of those guys or gals that immediately goes to start to hang a new converter uh, when they have that code stored in a customer's car, well, you've probably already figured out by now that that was a mistake most of the time that these codes are stored in the computer. It has nothing to do with a faulty converter. Uh, the converters are designed to last the lifetime of the vehicle, but they're kind of finicky. They have to have this, just the right parameters in order to work properly. As Joe shared with me, he said, if you want to consider a catalyst efficiency below threshold or less than what it should be, consider the same thing when it comes to the engine. What if the engine wasn't producing quite the power that it should? Does that automatically mean that the engine is at fault and needs to be replaced? Of course not. It means that something in the operating parameters and conditions that that engine needs to run its best is not happening. It could be one cylinder low on compression. It could be one cylinder that's not getting the fuel or the air that it should. It could be that something as simple as a bad mass sensor. These are all things that we have to consider when we're looking at catalyst efficiency codes. The, the, uh, the catalytic converter has to have a very specific range of feed gases being sent into it. And that, that range, when you look at lambda as the reference, of course, when everything is right, lambda is 1.000. And you can see that with your five gas analyzer. But for that catalytic converter to work at its optimum efficiency, the feed gas range is only one half of 1%. You heard me, one half of 1%. So lambda needs to be anywhere from 1.005 to 0.995, again, a very narrow range. So that's one of the very first things. If you look at your five gas analysis of what's coming out of that tail pipe, if it's not in that very narrow range, that means that something's amiss. The operating parameters and conditions are not where they should be. But before we get started on specific tips on helping you to diagnose the codes, let's take a look at some of the things that I know that I've uh, abided by in the past. I wanted to ask Joe and the team at Walker Emission Controls First of all, what they thought of these factor fiction testing techniques. Let's start with this one. How about a visual inspection? I know that I always thought that if I took out the upstream oxygen sensor or disconnected the exhaust right directly in front of the converter and took a visual inspection, I could see first whether there had been any damage done to the converter. Was it all busted up? Was it melted? Was it clogged? To get an idea if there was an outside factor that contributed to its demise, if you didn't see anything wrong with it visually, then there uh, it probably is just the converter itself. Was that true? Here's what Joe had to say. Typically, you know, it's not a bad idea to do that, but I think it's becoming more and more uh, difficult on newer cars. So there's other ways um, to determine that. Usually on, on most newer vehicles, you can just take a look at the shell of the converter and if it's uh, melted, if it's been overheated, typically the shell is going to be a bright bronze color or may even have a rainbow blue color. And that's a good indication that further inspection is required. And that's when you're going to want to pull an O2 sensor out and do an inspection like that. And, you know, time's money. So, so I would say, you know, if there's indications, yes. Um, it, certainly if the back pressure is high, um, you'd want to pull the, the O2 sensors out and run back pressure tests. Um, through those ports, um, and that also would would help you figure that out. But it's not always easy to see a melted um, converter. Even with even with a scope, 
because um, normally the center of the converter runs hottest, and that's what melts first. So a lot of times the honeycomb section could look look fine, you know, from the front or the rear, um, but um, it's very difficult to see if it's melted unless you can put a light behind it and then a scope in front. It's um, it's very difficult for the untrained eye to, to see one that's melted in the center. Another factor of fiction that I wanted to clarify with Joan was the use of a temperature test on the converter. You know, that was something else that we we're uh, often been exposed to, was that factor of fiction. You know, we were taught or we've been uh, exposed to a lot of instructors who tell us that we can use an IR gun or a temperature gun to measure the temperature going into the exhaust and then measure the temperature coming out of the converter. And if we saw an increase, then that meant the converter was okay. Is that really the case? Again, here's what Joe had to say about that. As far as the converter temperatures, yeah, it's true. It's, uh, there's a um, exothermal reaction taking place in the converter. So, um, the the if you if you know how to test it properly for for temperature, you should see an increase. So, the the key thing here is you want to make sure you're measuring the temperature at the weld ring at the front of the converter and at the weld ring at the rear. Okay, so the weld ring is where the inlet pipe is welded. Um, and where the outlet pipe is welded. And so that's got the best, uh, I would say, um, connection to the substrate itself. It's not a direct connection, but it's the most consistent connection. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the heat shielding and, and different things, it's, it's kind of difficult to get a, a good temperature reading anywhere else. So if you're measuring it there, usually you're going to see if the vehicle's been driven, let's say, on the highway for five minutes, um, you should see at least a 150 degree increase in temperature at the back of the um, converter compared to the front, but that doesn't necessarily indicate that the converter is bad if um, the temperature difference isn't there. It just means operating conditions, once again, aren't, aren't good for it to light off. So, so that's a good way to test to see if the converter is lighting off but it doesn't really condemn it as being bad. So if, if, if you're out of Lambda, let's say you're running a little bit rich or a lot of it rich at um, 0.97 or something like that Lambda, you, um, the converter is going to be the same temperature going in and out because it's not lighting off. And, and the same would happen if you're running a little bit too lean and you don't realize it, um, the converter won't light off and it doesn't mean it's bad. It just, you know, it just means the conditions aren't right for it to, to operate. So to kind of recap, a visual inspection is not a bad thing. It shouldn't be the very first thing that you do. But if you have the car up in the air, you can check it for any signs of overheating by looking at the condition of the shell. If you see that, that bright bronze coloration or that rainbow blue that's an indication that it's overheated, then it's, it's possible that there's a problem inside and there's a meltdown internally. Are you going to see that visually? Not necessarily, as Joe pointed out. What's the best way to test for that or check the condition of that? an exhaust back pressure test. Then it'll give you an idea of whether there's meltdown there, which of course would lead to a restriction in flow. Now, the other side of that coin is if you can look inside it and get an idea of what may have caused that converter to become poisoned. Uh, again, as it turns out, the coolant uh, is not as uncommon as many of us might think. Leaking cylinder head gaskets are more common than we tend to give them credit for, though it may not be causing a drivability problem. So you can look inside that substrate and you can get an idea if there's any of that discoloration, that green, pink, orange tinge that would come from ingesting coolant. That could be an indication of where you need to go to ultimately solve your customer's problem. And then of course, as you see it uh, clogged with carbon, well, that's another issue that you need to correct before you do anything with the converter itself. So uh, on the other, on the temperature, let's clarify that too, make sure we have that point understood. All you're going to know if you see that temperature increase is that the catalytic converter did have what it needed to light off, to start working. If you don't see that, that's really not a, a, a call to change that converter. That doesn't mean the converter is bad. It just means that what it needed to do its job is not present. So we have to go back and figure out what that was. And that's where the next part that I like to talk about comes in. What would you recommend to a uh, technician who is new to that type of diagnostics to to proceed? Uh, I know that's probably a really big question, 
<laughs> to fill a three-hour seminar, but and more, but uh, in, in, a, in a synopsis, what do they need to consider other than the fact that maybe the converter is bad? I'm glad you asked me because we um, actually put together what we call um, our five basic checks. So if you're a new technician who doesn't do a lot of converter repairs, um, following these five checks really resolves uh, the majority of of issues that cause a P420 or P430 code. So, but um, the five basic checks are uh, to to keep them short and quick. The first one's basically uh, retrieve and repair all all other PCM codes first. So if you have any other trouble codes, repair those first before repairing the P420, P430. Um, and part of that first check is also to check for available. Um, technical service bulletins or, or PCM reflash updates. So basically make sure you know every, the, the computer's happy on other, all other aspects. The second check is to um, check for and resolve any exhaust leaks. Um, the converter really relies heavily on the um, feed gases going into it being the proper mixture and, and if there's an exhaust leak that plays havoc with the the feed gas is going to the converter, so so check and repair any exhaust leaks. And usually, you know, it's always a good idea to fix all exhaust leaks, but uh, anything ahead of the converter and within about a foot and a half, two feet behind the converter are, are really important. And and even small pinhole leaks, um, for example, around the O2 sensor fitting, you know, in the weld or something like that, can cause a big issue. Uh, the third one is make sure the vehicle's in fuel control, and we simplify that by giving them some basic O2 sensor reading. So basically, you're looking for the the rear uh, O2 sensor reading to be steady and equal to or above 450 millivolts. So the rear one should be fairly steady at 450, or it can be above but never below. Um, and this is when the vehicle is idling or at a constant cruise state. And, um, or if you have a 5DF analyzer, um, it makes it even easier. You're just looking at lambda reading that's calculated by your 5DF analyzer and you want it to be as close to one as, as you can, you know. Um, and, you know, almost perfect isn't perfect, so, um, you know, one is really what you're looking for for your for your um, air fuel mixture, you know, through a 5 gas. And then um, also the hydrocarbons should be low, be, be low 65 parts per million. Usually they're much lower than that if you have a 5 gas, but that um, gives you a good indication of how good, how good your ignition and compression are. Um, the fourth one is test for contamination. So a lot of converters actually get destroyed by um, coolant leaks, so a lot of people, you know, who have head gasket or intake gasket leaks, they uh, they uh, just keep adding coolant and that usually ends up in the exhaust damaging the converter. Um, and the last one is, based, is really simple, just make sure that if you have replaced the converter that you've, uh, you're using the correct converter. So years past, a lot of technicians were used to having, you know, three different converters on their shelf and they would put them on anything. So they'd have, you know, a two inch, a two and a quarter, and a two and a half, and they'd make them work on anything. And um, today you really, uh, because of making, because of how critical and um, the, the computer uh, has gotten as far as emissions go, you really need to make sure that you have the proper loadings and the proper size converter. You know, too big isn't good and too small isn't good, so we need to have the right size converter and the right loading. All right, I'm getting a little older and I need to refresh my memory, but let's recap that for everyone. What are the first things that you should do when your customer brings you a vehicle with the mill light on and a, DT, uh, a DTC 420 or 430 stored? First of all, make sure that you retrieve and repair all of the other stored trouble codes. Especially if you find something that's going to be related to a fuel trim or misfire issue, you definitely need to get those fixed before you can rerun the monitor and uh, see if the, now, uh, the vehicle passes. While you're at it, you've heard us say this a million times, make sure that you check for any applicable technical service bulletins in your service information system. The fix for your customer may just be a simple reflash of the ECM itself. Number two, check for any exhaust leaks. 
This is probably one of the harder things that you need to do. Uh, there are several companies now that are offer a, a high pressure smoke machine that can come in handy for checking for exhaust leaks. Uh, if you can't access that, you just have a regular smoke machine you've been using for EVAP testing. Well, then you can also use that, but you may have to put some air behind that in order to, uh, to pressurize the system enough to show up these small leaks. Um, another step that you can use that I've been very successful with is just holding a, a piece of fuel line to your ear and the other end up near the suspected areas of leakage on the exhaust. Uh, you can actually hear that air leak you know, through that tubing. So that's one way that you can do it. Uh, but you have to make sure that you use the system that's going to allow you to check for leaks in areas that you can't visually see. So I would say the smoke is probably your best alternative there. Um, number two, make sure that the vehicle is in fuel control. control. Uh, as Joey, Joe pointed out in some of our conversations, you can have a good lambda reading on your five gas but that doesn't mean that you're in good fuel control. You also have to look at the other emissions coming out. If you have high HC, have high NOx, then you could have what Joe pointed out as the cylinder imbalance, that 15% that, that or less of the cases that lead to this code that are caused by a cylinder imbalance. You've got one cylinder, it's either too rich, too lean, and it's throwing off the bank and, and making the converter work a lot harder than it should. Again, test for uh, contamination. You can look for that color tinge that we talked about and you can perform a block test. Uh, there are several ways that you can check for a, a coolant contamination, but make sure that you don't rely on just one or two. If, if you think that's part of the problem, then you need to test that vehicle cold, hot, uh, make sure that you uh, verify that the engine's sealed good and tight. And then the, the last of the steps that Joe commented on, hey, make sure that you use the right converter. If you are gonna replace the converter, use the right one for that application especially critical on the newer vehicles. In fact, as those emission standards increased, so did that need for the proper converter for that vehicle. The old days are just throwing on, quote unquote, a universal product and expect things to, to be right and for the light to stay off, well, that's not gonna happen. And as Joe pointed out too, and as you've heard us say many times, when you're doing any kind of drivability repair, any kind of ECM related DTC, you have to satisfy that ECM. That's gonna be your ultimate customer. If you don't make it happy, that light's going to come back on. That's going to back. Well, hey, thanks. That's going to about do it for this edition of the trainer. Uh, I want to give a lot of thanks to the folks at Walker Emissions Control, especially Joe Baccarella, for taking the time to share their considerable expertise with us today. Um, their links to their website are in the video description below. Uh, there are also links to their YouTube video in the video description below. There's a lot of great resources that will help you master those five basic steps that they want you to take or recommend that you take to uh, properly diagnose these codes. And if you do, hey, you're going to keep the ECM happy, you're going to keep your customer happy, and you won't have any comebacks. So uh, this is Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine. See you next month. Mm -hmm.